Matthew didn't know he had an illness. I mean, he just knew he was in the hospital for a week. He was uncomfortable sometimes. Some of the tests were pretty horrendous to put anyone through, much less a 18-month-old child. Um, but he didn't know, and it was very hard to, in between that time, um, from what I remember, to you know keep a stiff upper lip, you know, play with him without crying. You know, look at him without saying this is gonna be the last moment that I see him. Um, telling him you love him a few extra times that day because you may not have him tomorrow. I mean, that's how afraid we were and really didn't know and really didn't have any answers. I saw my pediatrician and he said, no, 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 let's wait till they're two. And it was, you know, that mother's kind of gut in instinct. I said, no, I don't want to wait till they're two. Uh, I want to see someone. I want someone else's opinion and I want to start working with them. I'm a first time mother and, you know, I don't know all the right things to do uh, in terms of talking to them and, and having two of them. It's even more difficult because you're always trying to run after the other guy and there's not that <laughs> sit down one on one time. And there was a lot of guilt on my part of I'm not giving them what they're supposed to, that, that they need. Well, I just find out I was very sad because I was thinking I'm alone. You know, I was thinking I was the only person who have a child with disabilities. And um, we went home and then the appointments began for this doctor, for the other doctor. We do serve infants and toddlers, and a lot of families are identified here. And it's very hard on the parents, and it's hard on the staff, too, as well, to sit down and to, you know, let them know what we're suspecting, let alone having them diagnosed. It wasn't until after my husband had left and uh, he was out passing out cigars to celebrate the birth of his second daughter that um, the next morning the pediatrician that was working the rounds that morning came and said, you know, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but you have a mongoloid daughter mentally retarded. And my advice to you is to institutionalize her, put her in a home, forget you had her, you're young enough to have more kids and go on with your life, otherwise she's gonna be a burden on your life because I don't think she's ever gonna be able to walk or talk or be able to do anything. The biggest thing that the parents go through um, at initial diagnosis, and it doesn't matter if it's at birth or several months later, is the shock because the dream that you've had for nine months as you're carrying the baby, the dreams of what your child is going to be, is, a lot of times is shattered. And so they're trying to then pick up the pieces and now deal with the disability that the family has had no training on at all. And so being able to talk to another parent who has experienced a lot of what those families are going through a lot of times takes a big weight off their shoulder. It's impossible to separate the infants and toddlers in particular from their family culture and it's very important that all cultures are respected and different cultures have different ways of dealing with infants and toddlers with disabilities and that has to be acknowledged and respected and that's part of what's work through in the process. A lot of times they feel like they're isolated from the other families. Being able to bring another family in and then being able to talk with them and build up a relationship with that other family very well could help. The professionals, we talk about all these medical terms and what his needs are and all these things and using medical terminology and educational terminology, the jargon that we tend to, to talk to each other in, but to really focus on mom's needs to say, okay, we're having this discussion, but I'd like to let you know what is going on to explain to the parent in plain, simple language and to say, these are the needs, but there are options to meet these needs. After um, Delbert was born and I thought I had overcome a bunch of obstacles with learning the techniques of taking care of him, and then came Christopher and learning more and more medical terms. I felt like I wasn't, I should have took up the field of nursing or something different because I felt like I was really becoming more experienced in that field of work. But I had the support of the Intervention Center and the Early Head Start staff who was willing to learn all that with me. And the support is just a big thing. My family was willing to learn everything I had to learn to help take care of Christopher and Delbert. 
So I just feel that intervention is just real important with Early Head Start, whether it's intervention centers or school districts that you work with, that it's just really important. Letting the parents know that we're going to take care of their babies, that it's a safe place, that we're not going to put their child in a corner. I think that the par any parent who puts their child in child care has fears, but I think it's probably especially intense for a family with a child with disabilities. So just letting them know that we want their child, that we're going to keep them safe, that we're going to make sure that the child's needs are met are the most important things. We all have our areas of expertise, but the people who are most interactive, who interact the most, the parents and the, the early Head Start teacher, they're the ones who, real, who know, and us, the specialists out there, need to look towards them and support them. We may have the terminology, we may have the connection, but we don't have the interactional. We're not interacting on the level that they are. So we need to look towards them. They are the, the, the people who really know, and they need to, we need to help them to trust themselves. We provide support for them, uh, and it might mean not just connecting with the resource, but it might mean saying to that individual teacher, you can do this, I'll be here to help you. You have help from the parents, uh, and we'll get as much information as we possibly can to make sure that you get the resources and information that you need to help to work with this particular child. And I think that the support that the family gave the staff was equally as important because we would just watch and see what they were learning and how they were handling all of the, the visits you had to make to the big hospital on the mainland and all the surgeries that he had to go through and all the new news that you find out about his body and its involvement that we could only gather that as strength for us in taking care of him. The professionals hopefully can provide support and information. We get parents just very hungry for information. Tell us what we can do. We've got a diagnosis, or we don't have a diagnosis, but we want to be able to do something. They may be sad, they may be angry, they may be glad that their child is alive, depending on what the situation is, but they want to be able to help their child. We have these two screening tools that we use. If there are issues within those developmental areas that kind of like um, alert the teacher that there might be some developmental delay, then they in turn will contact me and say, I'm concerned about this child. Let the parent know that they've notified me and then we meet. And I talk to them about their concerns about their child, see if they have any concerns let them know that there are different agencies that I can hook them up to. They want to feel equal and the same, but they also want to feel supported. And sometimes I feel like challenged in finding the right way to ask um, if they need my help, if I'm doing my job, if they're happy with what we're offering. And um, I used to say a lot, I have concerns, or I would like to know. I, and I found out that really doesn't work because it sets up the, the tone of the conversation and they usually like get very stressed. Um, and I just found out if I ask them, just like by the way, oh, how are you doing? Um, what's happening in the household? You know, how is uh, Johnny doing today? It works much better. I can get more information. And it took me a while to pick up on that. By having our own nurses here who were people she knew and she could pick up the phone and say, um, what's going on now and I'm scared or what do you think I should do? Um, having that extra person because Children's Hospital is two and a half hours away and there you get a doctor, every other kind of doctor you can get. Um, having one, one person that she can call and say, what do you think I should do? 
is a great service to have. I've learned a lot about the laws and uh, the rights of parents because I have to learn that in order to be advocates for them and be able to uh, articulate that to parents. And so I've learned quite a bit as a professional. Uh, I think it's kind of taken my, my career to another level uh, because when I was in, when I got in early childhood, I didn't get in it particularly to work with children with disabilities, I just got in to work with children. And it's kind of opened up and kind of added to uh, my professionalism by being able to do this. A lot of times I go into a home and the doctors have painted this picture of what to expect of a child with disabilities early on as a newborn. They're told a lot of times your child will never be able to walk, your child will never be able to talk, they won't be able to do anything. They'll require your total care for the rest of their life. And it's a pretty bleak picture for a lot of these families and they think that, you know, why do I need to do anything with my child because they're not, never going to be able to do anything with anything. So I come in there with a big smile on my face <laughs> and try and change the picture of it all. Try and let them know that there is a chance for their child and you take one step at a time. The system wasn't set up to really make it parent friendly or family friendly to really do that now. Um, especially programs such as this one that it's just, you know, it's uh, just part of the dialogue. It's just, you know, like saying good morning, God bless you after you sneeze. You know, it's just part of the dialogue, which is so important I and mean, really ingrained in the philosophy that you are not alone. We are part of this together and we're going to work at a solution together. You just have to be ready to listen to the mom and listen to the baby. So. Um, I think it's been later that, that you, you kind of want staff to come to an awareness on their own and be ready to accept information. I think the first place that I would ever want to be is, who is this child and how am I going to take care of him? Not what the disease parameters are, you know, the disability. Really focus on the child. fears that the teachers and the staff have, I always said, you know, I as a mother or a father or, you know, grandfather or siblings did not pick to have a child with Down syndrome. This was a shock to us. But, and when they told us that she wasn't going to walk, she wasn't going to do this, she wasn't going to, it was all don't, don't, don't. Like barriers were already being set up. As, as the mother, the way I took it was, no, you know, but she had her heart surgery and they told me she wasn't going to stand or whatever. And, she started pulling out her IVs at the hospital and she stood up on the rails on the crib at the hospital. They said, no, this is the feisty little one we have here. I go, she's gonna give him a heck of a fight, so I'm gonna fight with her. I'm gonna be next to her. My family was a real support to me because I found out Christopher was gonna be born with spinal bifida early on in my pregnancy and my family followed me to every doctor's appointment, to the delivery room, to every doctor's appointment after that. My mother stayed with me at the hospital when Christopher was born for four or five days. She didn't go home. She, she was there the whole time making sure that um, I was taking care of myself as well as Christopher. My daughter, she said, oh yeah, you know. Well, my brother Matthew was born with possibilities and he showed us how special we are. So my first reaction was to say, sweetheart, the word is impossibility, the word is dis, dis uh, and I couldn't even finish it. You know, I couldn't even finish the word because it just, you know, I like listened to what Melissa had said and it just seemed to be so much more positive and, and so much more life affirming. <laughs>